You would state your name and DLC number. Travis Rogers, 375301. You are a first offender, armed robbery, two counts of manslaughter. You were sentenced on 317-1997, 5-2-1997, and you're sentenced to 75 years and 40 years. Your parole date is 12-18-17, and also your good time is not eligible and a full term uh, is 12-27-2070. Today, I see all the guests here today, but we're going to be asking you some questions. This case is signed by Mr. Alvin Roche. And also on the board is Miss Pearl Wise, myself, and we'll be voting on this and ask you some questions. This time you would, Mr. Alvin Roche. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Good morning, Mr. Rogers. Good morning, sir. May I call you Travis? Yes, sir. Travis, you recognize all three of the panel members? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and it was just the luck of the draw, because this this schedule was made in October of last year. So uh, I'm gonna tell you quite frankly, quite frankly, this is the first case in five years that I I have no presentation for. Yes, sir. Uh, I read the facts again, and I've spent more time on your case than I've spent with my family in the last seven days, because I can't make up my mind. Um, we saw you on December 14, 2017. Yes, sir. And Let's get this out the way, first of all. Have you had any disciplinary write-ups since your last hearing? No, sir. Okay. Have you completed any programs since your last hearing? Yes, sir. Okay, tell me about the programs. I've taken See my heart, not my pants. Thanking for a chance. One second, one, one second. And let me tell you this up front, in front of your attorney. And of all attorneys that represent offenders, I hold Professor Hogan in high esteem. She's a very uh, fair, honest, and a very good attorney, and you made the right choice. Yes, sir. And I'll get on her narrative just a little bit later on. But this interview today, the way this interview goes, it will it will make it will, it will make up my mind, and I'll make a decision based on this interview. Okay. Yes, sir. So tell me about the programs you've taken in the last three years. Well, I'll tell you, thank you for a change. See my heart, not my past. Sign language. Faith over the marriage. Great survey of the Bible. Great truth of the Bible. And okay, okay, tell me about the good time classes that you took. Thank you for a change. Thank you for a change. Okay, okay. is that it? Yes, sir. Okay, tell me about the sign language. Sign language was just something that I wanted to do based upon me doing what I did. And I see that Miss Reva was a, a caring person. So she really inspired me to really do something for myself and beyond to be better. And that was one of the challenges things that I did. Okay. Do you plan to use that training? Uh after you release? Sign language, yes sir. I sure would like to because it, it's a good communication kit with the deaf. Yes sir. Okay. Now, and we quite frank with you this morning. So, so basically this is the conversation between me and you. Yes sir. You are a predator in New Orleans. 
Yes, sir. You you hovered downtown New Orleans looking for tourists. Yes, sir. And, and to make a make a living for yourself. Yes, sir. I won't go over your long criminal history. Even though you're first felony offender, you have a rap sheet, yay long. Disturbed the peace, aggravated rape. Are you arrested for that early on? There was no charges. There, there is a stolen possession of stolen goods, uh, theft, your whole litany of crimes. But you're first felony offender, so we will go on that. Now, after you were convicted of two counts of armed robbery, you are facing a first degree murder trial while committing a crime. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And how did your attorney manage to do a plea for manslaughter? I don't understand that. Can you, can you give me some information? Well, I really can't explain it, but my attorney, he came to me, he said, he said, well, he said, Travis, he said, um, the DA want to make a deal with you and give you 40 years on manslaughter. He said, are you willing to take it? I said, well, yeah. So it was as simple as that? Yes, sir. The DA's office offered it, and you saw a chance to avoid a life sentence, um, uh, and you took the deal. Yes, sir. He told me that would be in my best interest. Okay. Oh, yes, it would be. Yes, sir. It would. It, it was in your best interest. Okay. So tell me what your job at the facility has been since 2017. Since 2017, well, all day school. I worked in the kitchen for 20 years, but recently, since 18, I've been in all day school trying to obtain my high set. I'm one subject away. Yeah, I see where you scored a 41 and you needed a 45. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, I know every detail there is. Yes, sir. So you took the test about two years ago. Have you taken it since 2018? Yes, sir. I took it. I failed, I failed it eight times reading. I took it two times this year and I failed it. But I had one more time before this pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. I had one more time. But I'm, I'm determined to get it. I'm determined to get it. He, he, was, scheduled, he was scheduled in March and the, the COVID-19 hit and he wasn't able to take it that final try in March. Okay. So, so basically, uh, you will, when things, wind back up, you will take it again. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I, I really, really uh, congratulate you on the effort that you are making to obtain your GED, which is very important to you. Needless to say, uh, Travis, you have a mountain of opposition. Uh, the litany of communications that I read from the population in Virginia. Ms. Reasoner was a special ed yes, teacher. Yes, sir. And, she, and she was well respected. She was well liked and her students suffered because of your actions. I don't know if you know this, all Ms. Rizna wanted to do was visit the 48 states that is in the continental United States. That was her, that was on her bucket list. Yes, sir. And the last state she had on the list was Louisiana. She had visited other 48, 47 states, and Louisiana was the last 
state on her bucket list. And all she wants to do is get her purse with her identification and all of her papers back. And you peruse the area and notice an elderly man sitting in a minivan with the side door wide open because Ms. Rizina and her mother went into St. Louis Cemetery number two just to see <clears throat> things like Marie Laveau's burial place. Yes, sir. Which is which which you knew was a very popular place for for visitors to visit. And prime ground for you to get some valuables or money. And you snatched the purse from the floor of the car and you walked away. And she tried to retrieve her belongings and you turned around and shot her in the face. I have to ask this question. And, and, and the crime is in the past and it has nothing to do with the day's proceedings. But why couldn't you shut the lady down? Why couldn't you have started running and outrun a 33-year-old lady? who was not very athletic, but you just walked away as if you had done nothing. And then you turned around and shot the lady to death. Why couldn't you just push her aside and run away? Well, Mr. Roche, one thing I couldn't realize, her people, hurt people. I was a hurt person all my life, all my days. I just walked around with hurt inside me. So I felt like hurting people, that was the only way that I could express myself. So I don't, I didn't feel I was hurting people. I'm being honest with you, Mr. Roche, but I am so remorseful for the things that I did that hurt those people like that. And if you wouldn't mind, I have a letter that I have prepared. Okay, and but no, let, let's save that for your closing statement, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. See, because if you would have used, used even committing the crime, you could have pushed her aside and got away. And she would have mended, went back to Virginia and continued her community work as a special ed teacher. I read the narrative that Professor Hogan read about a 23 year old uh, who was brought up in the St. Thomas projects and was feeling for himself and you lived in an environment and that's all you knew is to take advantage of individuals and get money to just survive. I read that entire narrative two or three times and Professor Hogan even touched my heart because she explained your mitigating circumstances to a point where I felt sorry for you. Yes, sir. And I also feel sorry for the victim's family. And what I have to decide this morning is, is that, are you rehabilitated? Have you matured to the level where you can rejoin society and not be a, a risk to public safety? You were not a teenager when you did this. You were 23 years old. You were a grown man. 
were you raised in a two-parent home? No, sir. I was raised. Who, who raised you? My grandmother, Evelyn Young, and my Aunt Carol, Carol Rogers. In the St. Thomas Project? In the Kelton area. In the Kelton area, by Xavier University? Yeah, yes, sir. Gertown? Yes, sir. Okay. So you were raised by a grandmother and an aunt. Yes, sir. Who probably taught you right from wrong. Yes, sir. Mr. Wise, I, I may come back later, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm uh, gonna yield the floor to me to Mrs. Wise. Okay, at this time, Ms. Pearl Wise will be asking you some questions. No, uh, Mr. Roche covered everything. I have no questions. Okay. At this time, uh, I see he has a, and is it a niece that's going to speak on his? Who's going to speak on his behalf? His niece, yes, sir. Okay, if you would um, mute your mic, ma'am. Give us your statement. If you would, unmute your mic and give us your statement, Ms. Burke. Okay. Give us your statement. Hold, hold, give it one second. You're going to have to get up closer to the and, and speak in to give your statement. Dear Pro Board, from Kasai, okay. the niece of Travis Rogers. Yes, I believe that my uncle should have a chance to live his life out of prison wall because he has a family that miss him. I miss him. I'm not saying that everybody's family doesn't miss them when they are locked up, but my uncle has changed since he's been locked up. He's been staying out of trouble. He calls me weekly, make sure I do my homework and update him on my grades. When he talks, when Tom, when he feels sad, he will call me and pray with me. And it breaks my heart to see someone you love sit behind prison wall because of something they have done wrong. But people have to make mistakes to understand, not to make them again. People should have a second chance to redeem themselves. People can change over years. That's what makes us human. If we don't make mistakes, how would we ever learn from anything? My uncle had done something very wrong that people would never understand why he did it. But when he got locked up, it changed his life forever. My uncle started to go to church, go back to school to get his GED. He made me proud by staying out of trouble and not caring what people got to say about him. If he can come home, that would be the biggest wish I ever had and that he will stand with my side for the rest of the life I have. This is for the victim family. I would like to apologize with my uncle Travis but we have done wrong. I know he has caused pain, hatred, anger, and hurt. And I also know that pain will never go away. But over time, you will learn to forgive people for what they have done wrong, but not judging. But not judging. If you don't forgive people for what they have done, how are you going to expect God to forgive you for what you have done? He has changed. And I'm just asking y'all just please let him, his family, but I know that hurt will go away. Just keep on praying, keep on peeling your head up. Mr. Mr. Wise, may I have another yes, bite at the apple, please? Yes, yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, I just want to enter to the record that uh, Mr. Rogers' last write-up was in 2009, in September of 2009, that's some 11 years ago. Warden Benoit, would you like to have any comments or remarks? Uh, no, sir, other than I was going to talk about his last ride up was in 09. He, um, he worked 20 years in the kitchen at the main prison. And the last two years, he's been trying to get this GED. That's what he's been working on so real hard. 
Thank you, Warden. Yeah. Mr. Wise, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you all very much. At this time, uh, was Mr. Honley going to speak? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Hunley, Executive Director of Louisiana Parole Project. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, in Travis's case, obviously he's not a Act 277 or Act 280 lifer uh, who are the priority cases for Parole Project. So anyone who's not an Act 277 or an Act 280 case, there's an even higher standard that our organization has when screening someone as a potential client, uh, as this board's aware, because they were the three members who were on his pa uh, panel two and a half years ago, Parole Project was not involved in his case now. And Parole Project is involved in Mr. Rogers' case because he wrote us several letters uh, asking for our help, not in, in his letters that I, I have in front of me right now, they weren't, please help me get my freedom. His letters were, uh, if I'm given freedom, I need help with my reentry. Uh, so that impressed me. Uh, in, I also looked to see what he had done since his last parole hearing, because I knew that the parole board was going to be interested in that. Uh, and as was just uh, mentioned, he's gone the last 11 years without a disciplinary infraction. Uh, Warden Benoit mentioned that he uh, was assigned to the kitchen for 20 years. Uh, and people who are not insiders and know this, the kitchen is a very difficult place to work for that long. In addition to that, not only did he work in the kitchen for 20 years, but he was a grill cook for his last 15 years. So uh, in the kitchen, uh, you there are different jobs. And to be a cook in the kitchen is a very thankless job. You can clean up in the kitchen, you can work on the serving line, and you get out of there quicker. To be a grill cook is to take on responsibility uh, that you get paid the same thing for someone uh, who doesn't want to do it. And I asked him, why were you a grill cook for 15 for so long? And he said, because he wanted to improve his lot uh, at the prison. He wanted to, to improve. So that, that impressed me um, in, in deciding if we were going to take him on as a client. One thing that was not mentioned yet uh, is that he did have uh, a substance abuse problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, oftentimes when you ask someone if they are an addict, they will respond that um, they are no longer an addict. And he freely admitted to me that he's still, you know, he considers himself an addict uh, and he's gotten treatment for that. So for me, those were signs of his maturity. Uh, so I just wanted to paint that picture why Parole Project decided to take Travis as a client. Uh, moving forward, what parole project offers if he is granted freedom? Uh, Travis would be accepted into our residential program. He would come to Baton Rouge uh, to do his intensive reintegration. That would include helping Travis learn the te technology that's developed over the last 25 years of in his incarceration, helping him learn financial management uh, from opening a bank account to building credit. Uh, we will also help him with learning how to you know, job interview skills, resume building skills. Most importantly, what modern day social norms are the same program that we have fidelity to with all of our clients that we've had uh, well over 135 people now uh, go through our program successfully. He would uh, have, you know, be given the same fidelity to that program. Uh, obviously, uh, I understand that Travis has a great deal of family support in the New Orleans area. And we recognize that individuals have a better opportunity at release uh, if they do have that family support. I also recognize some of the concerns here or, or previous crimes that he has committed in the New Orleans area. So what I submit to this board today is that Louisiana Parole Project's plan, reentry plan for him is to stay with us in Baton Rouge until we would be confident that he is ready to transition to the New Orleans area with his family, uh, where he already has a job offer from the Dove Group uh, building air conditioning vents. If for some reason the board is not satisfied with that reentry plan, I would make a commitment to this board uh, to allow Travis to stay with us in Baton Rouge until he was in a position 
where he can he is self-sufficient and can afford his own apartment somewhere else. And of course, we would give him continued case management uh, even after he leaves our program. But I'm just offering, I'm not encouraging the board of that. I'm just putting that out there as the executive director. I am offering that uh, for the board's consideration. Uh, in my opinion, uh, Travis in the last two and a half years has continued to build his resume, has not sulked. Uh, he is a 48 year old person. I submit to the board that this would be a good time to release him because he, he is young enough right now to start a career, work for the next 20, 25 years and uh, you know, make a retirement for himself. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Holland. At this time, we'd like to have the uh, victims of this case uh, come on also the DA, but this time we're going to take the victims. If y'all would, unmute your mic and you can speak. Yes, my name is Alma Razor. I'd like to say, okay. like I said before, He's still breathing. My only child is not. My daughter worked hard on the farm for what she had. She paid her own way with scholarships through college. Her dad and I paid out very little other than a used car for her first car. She bought and paid for all of her other vehicles. She did allow her dad and me to buy her three acres of land across the road from our house. She had had a septic system put in and had her well dug. She was going to build a large house and fill it with God's special children. In other words, children nobody wanted, abused children. She never got the chance to build that house because of a murderer's bullet. A murderer who robbed and stole from those who did work. He was never charged with the attempted murder of my husband. In a packet I sent, there is a picture of the bullet hole in the hood of the van. I didn't get a picture of the bullet hole in the windshield, but I'm sure the police had one. When he ran, my husband ran after him and jerked the car door open. As they were pulling out and some papers fell out that proved the car was stolen. It is my understanding they also held up an elderly man at a liquor store before he saw my daughter and killed her about noon on Christmas Eve. Noon on Christmas Eve. Read his juvenile record again. That's all he's ever done, robbing and stealing from others. And it finally led to murder. He is a murderer. No need to sugarcoat that word. He is a murderer. And he will be back into the same thing if he is paroled. He could have turned his life around at any time, but no, from a bad juvenile to a robber and thief and to finally murder. He was not charged, he has not changed, just gotten bolder and worse. The next person he kills may be your daughter or granddaughter. There are no jobs out there right now for honest workers. So no one is going to give a murderer a job. If that title hurts him, he might as well get used to it. That's a title that will never leave him. I've never heard a word of remorse, just tried to convince everyone he has changed. My daughter lived a life that she didn't need prison to change. As a thief and robber, maybe he can change. And if he can remember who he stole from, try to make restitution. But he is a murderer and can't restore life. 
he is a murderer and then attempted to, to attempt to commit another murder. Might as well call it what it is, murder. Your Governor John Edwards seems like a nice person. From what I have read about him, and I know he would not approve millions of dollars to advertise your state in order to bring tourists there just to be killed on the street by your citizens. But that's what happened on Christmas day at noon, eve at noon we had visited the other 48 states without incident we only lacked hawaii and alaska our aim was to visit all 50 states we did not know this person who killed my daughter and he did not know us my daughter was a special education teacher her students were her life she knew sign language, and when she heard there was a blind child coming up through the system, she got busy and learned Braille. She was certified in Braille, ready for this child, but before she got to use it, she was murdered. She was a pilot. She loved to fly. Her next goal was to get her helicopter license. And then retired from teaching, she wanted to go into med flight. Her goal was always to help others. Yes, she was a special person, not only to her dad and me, but to a lot of people. And I don't think that's more evident that now, from the messages we've got from people that still remember her, but she was special to me and her dad. She was their only child. And we loved her very much. And I'm sure there's people that love this man. But he's going to return right to the same thing. He's going to return to drugs and to killing and stealing and robbing people. Because if you read his juvenile record, that's all he's ever done. And like I said, he is still breathing. My daughter, my only child, is not. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, uh, Mr. Ambrose. <clears throat> what do you say? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mary Ruth Lash. <clears throat> uh, I was Connie's principal at the middle school where she worked. And uh, today, having to face this hearing, it just brings back Travis's horrific action to life all over again. It makes everyone suffer, suffer as if the murder has just taken place again. This hearing is like rubbing salt in an open wound, a wound that will never Heal. Travis has no regard for human life. He didn't have to kill Connie. She did not pose a threat to him. And I honestly believe that Travis Rogers is a natural born killer. And if he were released, he would kill again. <clears throat> Travis has nothing to offer this world. Please do not release him to ruin someone else's life like he did Connie and her parents. Connie was their only child and her death left them broken hearts. Their world as they knew it came to a screech halt, just like Connie did when he shot her and killed her. Travis Rogers does not deserve to be paroled. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Thank you very much. At this time, the Assistant DA, Mr. Ingers, uh, have anything? Uh, yes, I'd like to thank the board. Uh, Michael Ambrose, on behalf of the state of Louisiana. Uh, my office is vehemently opposed to an early release for the offender here. Um, this is based in large part on the violent nature of his crimes at issue. Furthermore, as we've heard, uh, the, the victim, she doesn't get another chance at life. The victim's life was cut short, permanently extinguished 
because of this senseless act. She has an um, infinite darkness, non-existence. We can't even comprehend what that would be like. Uh, the defendant, furthermore, the defendant has only been in prison since the 90s. So that begs the question, what is a human life worth in this instance? 25 years, 30 years? It would be patently inequitable to release this offender so early on. To release the defendant, it would serve as an affront to the victim, the victim's family, and the community as a whole. The defendant deserves to serve his full term. Thank you. Thank you, sir. At this time, um, Ms. Hogan, uh, counselor today, however you want to work the last part of the hearing. I will reserve my comments, Mr. Wise, until after Mr. Rogers has made his final statement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rogers, this time, anything you'd like to say to the board? Yes, sir. I would like to read this letter that I, that it took me forever to prepare because I know there's something that it must be done. So without further delay, to all those who were victimized by my foolish and impulsive behavior, Mr. Albert Anderson, Mr. Elder Franklin, Mr. James, Miss Alma, and kind and Reza, family and friends, this is from the heart to the heart with the most sincere apology I've ever made in my life that I truly mean because it's something I know I owe each and every one of you. I apologize from the bottom of my heart, and I am extremely remorseful for my foolish and impulsive behavior that have caused so much pain and hurt. December the 19th and 25th, December the 19th and 24th, 1995, will forever be remembered because I victimized innocent people who didn't deserve what happened to them. Who was I to take with Mr. Anderson, Mr. Franklin, and the Reza family has successfully earned, and nobody would be exact who thought on him by himself and what he wanted. It hurt me even more living with the fact that I took a life, one that ended way too soon, and due to my foolishness and selfishness and stupidity, you, you people will forever be tormented by my past actions. Yes, I was wrong, and I take full responsibility for my actions. Mr. and Ms. Reeve, your daughter Connie was a beautiful person, in spirit and in truth that she owed love to anybody in every way she could. It wasn't often awesome that you would meet a person like her that all people from all walks of life adored. Even the blind, she had a passion for, which inspired her to learn Braille because she had a heart for people in spite of the imperfection. She gave her time, hope, and most of all, her love that was needed to endure the mental hardship. I heard all the places and things that have been named in memory of Ms. Connie. Well, to be honest, the world should be named after kind of world because she was just that sweet of a person with that much love for everybody in it. If I could turn back the hands of time and undo what I did, I will, without second guessing that thought. Since I came, I have dedicated my life to being a better person that's striving every day to make a difference in a positive way with Miss Kind of Memory playing in my heart. It's because of her, she inspired me to learn a sign language to communicate with the deaf now that I have a heart for people in spite of the imperfections. As I said in my opening, this from the heart to the heart, with my sincere effort to do the right thing, I'm praying that y'all will find the strength through Christ our Savior to grant me y'all forgiveness, and that he continue to comfort y'all with the bitter that needs to get through life. I thank y'all so much, and really appreciate this opportunity to apologize from the bottom of my heart. Best of wishes, Travis. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Wise. Um, Mr. Rogers worked on that um, during his victims awareness class and he's been working on that letter for years. So I appreciate that the board allowed him the opportunity to read that. Um, Mr. Rogers' uh, institutional record really speaks for itself. He has a sense of determination and work ethic that makes him a good candidate for release on parole. He told you that he has not given up on getting his high set and he's taken that, that test eight different times. He continues to excel and improve every single time. And even though he's one subject away from earning his high set, he's determined to get it um, no matter what. And he was gonna take the test in March. If he is released on parole, the parole project will be able to ensure that he takes that final 
test in reading and, and obtains as high set, that can be one of the one of the things that the parole project ensures that Mr. Rogers is able to accomplish. Um, Mr. Also, it wasn't mentioned, but Mr. Rogers is a very active member in the faith-based community, and he has been throughout his incarceration. He's a singer in the choir, the Full Gospel Choir, uh, Full Gospel Assemblies of God, which is the largest inmate organization, uh, inmate congregation at Angola. He um, has had only 20 write-ups in total. None of them were for substance abuse, dirty urine, contraband, things like that. He has never had a write-up for that. He's taken multiple substance abuse courses, AA, NA. He has um, complied with, he has achieved sobriety in prison and a sense of faith in prison that is truly remarkable and means that Mr. Rogers is just a different person today than he was 23 years ago. Um, he also has a very strong reentry plan. He has, as Andrew told you, he has the full support of the parole project and whatever, whatever this board would need to have in place in order to feel confident that Mr. Rogers could be granted early release, the board, uh, the parole project will be willing to implement that, whether it is um, asking that he stay with the long term or any conditions that this board wishes to place on Mr. Rogers, we will ensure that he meets those requirements. Um, and so I submit that the person before this board, you know, he's determined, he doesn't give up on things. He did not give up um, when he was denied two and a half years ago, and he continued to take religious or uh, religious classes. He took thinking for a change. He took a sign language course. Um, he continued on in, at his job. He tried for the high set again. He hasn't had a single write-up since 2009. He's also been a class A trustee since 2014, six years. And even before that, he was a class B trustee uh, without incident. So we would submit that this, that uh, as Andrew said, the time to release Mr. Rogers is the, an appropriate time to release him is now. He is young enough, he's healthy, and he has got uh, marketable job skills. So he would be able to be a law abiding, uh, tax paying member of society. And he has the full support of his family and our organization if he is granted release under any conditions deemed appropriate. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Professor Hogan, I have one question, please. Yes, sir. Uh, I noticed in the PPI, the address he submitted to the parole of probation was rejected because his aunt said she didn't have room for him. Does he have another plan for a permanent residence? So. I, I was unaware that that address was rejected, but we he has multiple family members. He has multiple aunts and he has a brother also. Um, that they're all watching today. You can't see everybody, but he does have a larger family. So there, if that address doesn't work, then we can certainly submit a, a long-term residence that, that would be appropriate. Okay, because the address that was rejected is uh, 2623 St. Peter's. Okay. I wasn't aware that it was rejected. Andrew, Andrew can answer that probably better than I can. Okay. That was the one submitted in 2017, Mr. Roche, that was rejected. He does have another aunt who um, he has an address for that was willing to let him reside with her. And it's been approved. We don't know if it's been approved, but it was submitted. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Okay. Thank each and every one of y'all today. If I no other questions here, uh, the board will. Uh, a uh, vote will be starting, Mr. Alvin Roche. Mr. Wise, I need a brief yes. executive session. I second. We have a second by Ms. Pearl Wise. Mr. Wise? Yes. Mr. Roche? Yes. Ms. Pearl? Yes.
It was only about a minute and a half. It's pretty quick. The wait was only about a minute, so not long at all. Uh, let's just jump into it and we'll unpack it at the end. Okay, and then everybody, uh, everybody back in. At this time, uh, the board will be voting. We're going to start with Mr. Roche. Me, unmute your mic, Mr. Roche. As I said before, Travis, this was a very difficult case for me. Um, uh, you've had good disciplinary right up. I mean, you had good disciplinary conduct since 2009. You've completely thank you for a change and you worked very, very hard on your GED. I think over a period of 24 and a half years, you, you realize exactly what you did that day and you're remorseful. And um, my vote is to grant your request upon completion of the GED. Upon completion of the GED, I want to give you some motivation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I also uh, want you to take other programs that are available while you're waiting on the answer from your GED. I want you not to sit down and be idle. I want you to work on that GED, take the test while you're waiting for the answer of the results, take some programs, be involved. After you release, and I also want you to get a permanent residency plan during that period. I'm gonna make one of the stipulations uh, before release that you have a permanent place to go after the Louisiana Parole Project. I know Mr. Huntley is willing to keep you long-term, but I'd like to see you get a permanent uh, residency plan so we know at DOC where you will go before release after you complete the Louisiana Parole Project. Yes, sir. So you have two conditions before release. Complete the GED, and get a permanent residency plan. Yes, sir. After release, you'll have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Since you had an alcohol problem and you are an addict and you admit that you're an addict, yes. you'll attend NAAA meetings at least twice a week. Yes, sir. You also have a story to tell. Yes, sir. And I want you to tell that story to disadvantaged youth at least eight hours a quarter. At this time, Ms. Pearl Wise. Uh, Mr. Travis, as I look back over my notes, last time in 2017, I voted to deny you, but I made a note that you write back. As uh, soon as you eligible for a rehearing, and I've been trying to remember why I, I made that note, and and it, and it has come to me. Uh, and I also want to point out, uh, in 2017, all of your victims opposed. Uh, when probation parole reached out to your victims in 2020, you do have one victim that's unopposed, and I just think it's important that you know that. <coughs> That victim, I'm not gonna call the names or whatever, but you do have one victim who is not against you getting out early. And that was refreshing for me. Uh, this, this is a hard decision. Uh, there's, there's no you know, no two ways about this, it's a hard decision. And I appreciate that you have done what you can do in terms of going, the trustee since 2014, 
uh, no write up since 2009. You are working on your, you are somebody that's doing what you can do. Uh, that's really appealing to me what you said about uh, the skill that you learned. Uh, th that's awesome. Uh, my vote is to grant your parole today for the reasons uh, already stated by Mr. Roche and also under the conditions that Mr. Roche stated. And, you, uh, and as you well know, you, you got to heal the client. Yes, for a lifetime. Yes, Good luck to you, sir. That's my vote. Appreciate <laughs> Okay, this this case here, I've, I've looked at it long and hard and I've done some things and you work real, real hard since you've been in there. You're on a 75 year DOC and a 40 year DOC sentence uh, because of armed robbery, two counts and a manslaughter. Today, I'm gonna be voting to deny your pro. By voting to deny your parole because you have your criminal history, strong law enforcement victims opposition for your release. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh. I wasn't expecting that. I think this is like only the second time that I feel that I could actually jump up and hug Jim Wise, my least favorite person on the parole board. I, you know, he was denied. You normally they have the formality of saying your parole's been denied, but he needed a unanimous vote and uh, it is officially denied. He's, he's still locked up. This hearing took place in 2020. I, uh, I'm okay. Let's unpack this. I mean, for one, I am just shocked that Mr. O'Shea would grant. I am just utterly shocked. I mean, this he was sentenced. He was sentenced in 1996. Uh, I mean, that's at the time of this hearing, that's 24 years. How is that enough time for taking a life? Taking a life in the callous way that he took that life. We heard about it. It was like, it, you know, a, a cheesy Hollywood dra dramatic movie could not have written a more dramatic, painful script. A special ed teacher who is visiting their final state in the intercontinental U.S. on Christmas Eve to be shot in the face in front of her family. Then you find out that she's not just a special ed teacher, but a love, beloved special ed teacher who was getting going to get her pilot's license, who was building a home for to adopt special needs kids. I mean, it, it the type of person that she was and the scenario that it happened, you couldn't make it up. And for it to be taken away by not a kid like they said, not a, they don't have an excuse that his brain wasn't fully developed. Although, you know, these days they're like, oh yeah, 26 now that your brain's developed, they're coming up with saying, oh, I don't know, they're coming, I don't know the science behind it, but please. He's 23 years old. And like Mr. Roche said, and I just don't get it. I don't get why Mr. Roche, and I believe every word that he said that he, that he spent more time looking over this file than he did with his family that week. And I do believe that he struggled over it. But the question when he said, why did you not just push her and run? Why did you not? And what was his answer? What was his answer? Hurt people hurt people? Really? Are you kidding me? You didn't hurt her. You shot her in the face. As the mother said, you murdered her. 
You are a murderer. Screw the YouTube algorithm. You are a murderer. A cold-blooded murderer. And then you have to sit through his niece. I wonder if it's the same niece, the aunt, his own sister, that when he's stuck in prison, his own sister says, I actually don't have room for him in my house. <laughs> that's his exit plan. The family that's supposed to, that's the family support. They When, when, when it's the, the time that he needs them most, they don't have, all of a sudden, they don't have room in, in, in their house. And that's the home that he puts his, as, his, as his residence plan. And then the niece has the audacity. And I get, you know, people don't meet, but you wrote that you wrote it out. You had to think about it. And what you say is first, it's you call it a mistake. She calls it a mistake. It's not a mistake. How do you put that into words? Leaving your home when it's raining without an umbrella is a mistake. Getting in a car accident is a mistake. Forgetting to pay your rent, well, I don't know, your bills is a mistake. Shooting a, a, a girl in the face, that's a mistake. And then it's just a pet peeve of mine. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. And we see it far too often is to actually address, to say, I'm going to now address the family don't judge, she tells them. And then she says, if you don't forgive him, how will God forgive you? Shame on you. I'm so sick and tired of it. I guess you might be a young girl and, you know, you have to go through life experiences, but I'm just sick and tired of it. And then we always have it after some, you know, moronic speech from the supporting family. We always hear then the victim, the victims say something that is just earth shattering. The DA was crying. I've never seen that before. I thought, man, was it, it could even be real tears. The ADA hears this stuff for a living. But he shed tears. And you hear her talk about just the utter, you know, if you're a true crime person, every crime story starts with talking about the victim and how wonderful they were. They usually say they would take their shirt off their back for you, which is such an overused, ridiculous saying. Uh, I, I, you know, and, and we always have to listen to like this 30, 60, 90 second monologue by the narrator talking about how wonderful the victim was. And, and it's, it's like, this was one of those times where it just wasn't fluff. It just wasn't. He took a beautiful person and he took her not because it was a mistake. It's because he's sick. And on Christmas Eve and in front of her parents and then on the final state, except for Alaska and Hawaii, and that's what you do. And at 24 years or even 20, who cares? You don't get to go out when the mother is still alive. Wait till she passes, if anything. I don't get it. Mr. Roche shocked me with this. I just won't understand it. I just don't. You're the victim's advocate. It makes no sense. What redeeming factor? And I just get nauseous listening to the parole project and Gene Hogan. It's like, you're really going to sit up there and he's like, we don't normally take clients that are, but he's special. It's like, shut up. You double talk, <laughs> you know, they're clients. You're getting paid. You'll take whoever you can get because it's money in your pocket. You don't care who you take. 
Yeah, they care a little bit. I'm sure they, they care something about the data. They, they probably have to keep recidivism rate as low as possible. But it's double talk. We hear them say, once a client, always a client. And then like six months later, they're, they're up for a revocation hearing. And where's the parole project? Nowhere to be found. It's double talk. Man, Jim Wise has saved the day. It's unbelievable. Now, I wonder when we're going to see him next. I wonder when he when he's allowed to Is it every five years for this type of crime. So we might see him again next year. Uh, good riddance. I don't want to. I For this type of case, for me, this type of case is, is easy as pie. I would simply say when the mother, when she passes... If you want to release someone, then release it only then, only then. I mean, you heard about his rap sheet. I just, what was it that the DA offered that deal so he took it? Do I need to hear that again? Okay, I just went back and listened to the beginning. Yeah, so he was charged with aggravated sexual assault. Uh, he was had other theft charges. He had a long rap sheet, but because of a weak DA, really, in my opinion, we've seen enough of Louisiana to know this, a weak prosecution office, none of those charges were, um, <laughs> were I guess, followed through. So they never got a felony. So they had plenty of chances to put him away and save her life. And then in this case, he was facing, because you're wondering, why was it manslaughter? Why is it not a full life sentence without the possibility of parole? And even then, I don't think Act 1, well, Act 1, 2, 2 might, st no, it might still have helped him, so who knows. But um, they, the, the, the DA offered him a deal. They said, we'll give you manslaughter. <laughs> it's like, they learned nothing. They learned nothing. And I bet you the DA told the family, I, we, we now know, we now know enough the DA lies to these families. We've seen it. We've seen the DA come out and apologize for lying to the family. Um, and they probably said, look, he has, you know, these sentences, um, although they're running uh, concurrently and not consecutively so they really still gave it light but they said it probably won't have chance of parole will be out i don't know what lies they made up because actually that's not even adding up to me um but why they would not i mean here is the the, the dog if you want to look at it now th this doesn't go into the details of the crime it's more about his pro his uh appeals which are nothing to go over but it goes here. So he's presently incarcerated in Louisiana following a trial by jury. He's convicted of two counts of armed robbery on March 17, 1997. And he was sentenced to 75 years um, each, right? So again, this is probably what they told the family. Wow, it's 75 years. He'll never get out um, to run concurrently. I don't know why they just didn't say consecutive. Um, but they don't show the manslaughter charge here for some reason. But... Anyways, the point is, is that they probably painted a picture that he would never have a chance of parole. And we see clearly that he does. And now the family has to, for the second time, that poor mother has to show up to the parole hearing. And think about the what that does to her po poor heart, to her up until this parole hearing, not knowing what the results would be. And then having to have the first two judges say yes and, and, and I think she would know, the DA would probably tell her like, hey, Mr. O'Shea is the toughest. He's the victim's advocate. Um, you need to get through him. And then for him to start off with a positive vote, um, it just must, you just, I, I don't think one can understand what it must have done to the family. And to, to, to and, you know, again, it's these weak DAs. It, it's just, it's disgusting. But thank goodness the ADA showed up. At least we had that. And uh, 
they should have just gone to trial. Maybe the family didn't want to go to trial, but I'm sure if the family knew that he that this guy would have a chance of parole after 20, after not even, he was he, he went to parole after like 15 years. He was just at parole, the first parole hearing. So I, I doubt that they that they knew that. And it's just sick. It makes me sick. But what do you think? I don't understand it. This one took me for a real loop. I'll tell you that. I thought he was going to get granted. Jim, Jim Wise. Maybe I'll be a little bit... A little bit nicer to him in the next few few hearings. But uh, with that, I'll let you go. Six classified as a first felony offender. Offense, manslaughter. Sentencing date. October 26, 1998. Sentenced to a total of 30 years. Parole date, October 10th, 2021. Good time, April 25th, 2022. Full term, October 21, 2027. Is this information correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Uh, hello, Ms. Whitehead. I see that you got 392 days. You've been in the transitional work form, uh, uh, program since, uh, let me see what the date I had here on 11, 10, 20 in the transitional work program. You've done some good programs since you've been incarcerated and you've done some good things. You're 45 years old. How many years you have on this 30 year sentence? 24 years, four months and 12 days. And how many minutes? You got that all figured out? No, sir. <laughs> no, nah, I've looked at you've done some good you've done some good programs and uh this was a this was a bad case. You went and you rehabilitated and I've seen some of the programs you've done with some good programs. Uh you know, we can sit here and talk about what all happened and everything. We're here to see what you've done since you've been incarcerated and you've done some good positive things since you've been incarcerated. Whether we vote to grant you today, to, to grant you or deny you, you're going to get out in April anyway. You do understand that, right? Yes, sir. And I see you've done some good programs. Where are you going to live? I'm pulling out to my daughter in West Monroe. Is this your daughters? I see there's two uh, speakers here, Tiffany and Blair. Yes, sir. How many children you have? I have my two daughters. Well, uh, I don't have any other, more, any other questions there, uh, Mr. Marabella. I went over a file real good. You're muted, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Wise. I don't see uh, any other questions. Uh, we do have some speakers. First, we will hear from Ms. Doris Brown and. Ms. Brown, if you will mute, unmute your microphone and tell us what you'd like us to know. Well, I don't know, I may cry on this. Because I would be very happy if she comes home. I've looked forward for this day. <laughs> did you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I did. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Miss Tiffany Strange, daughter. Hear me? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you well. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tiffany. She's she's the one um, she's going to be living with. That she's going to be coming home to. Um, it's been a long 24 years without her. I lost her when I was 14 months old and I am now 25 and I think it's time for her to come home to her kids and her grandchildren. 
uh, <laughs> I know she gets out in April, but it would sure be great for her to come home early. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now we will hear from Ms. Blair. Pretty much like my sister said, it's been a long, long 24 years. I have memories with her, but growing up, it's been hard without her home with us. And we look forward to many more memories and we, are beyond ready for her to come home. And it's it's been long enough. Very long. Thank you very much. Is the panel ready to vote? Yes, sir, I am. Mr. Wise? At this time, I'm going to be voting to grant. I'm going to vote to grant. You got good family support. You've done some good things since you've been there. You've got good programs. You classified as a low risk. And uh, from what I see here, all uh, staff and everything positive support towards you. I'm saying you've done over 24 and a half years on a 30 year sentence. You have an outdate of April. You need to be with your family and you need to put this behind you and no contact with any victims, okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> Ms. Jackson? Uh, yes. Um, Ms. Whitehead, I concur with um, my colleague think you have done well. You've served a significant portion of your sentence. You're low risk. And you've had some good programs. So my vote today is to grant your early release. Good luck to you. you. <laughs> Ms. Whitehead, uh, my vote likewise is to grant. Uh, you've got great family support. Uh, you've done well while you've been in prison. And you've done a lot of, you've had a lot of programs and you've served a substantial portion of your sentence. So your parole has been granted today uh, with conditions as will that be outlined by uh, your parole supervisor. Good luck to you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Maribella, I believe we're ready to close our right. concordia. Uh, the time is uh, one uh, twelve fifty eight. We will be closing. You know, I wish, I wish, I wish that I could unpack this for you, but we don't have any any information on it. It's a black hole, and when you don't have the victims there to talk, you don't have a DA to show up. You don't have, you know, really. I find it is a bit of a travesty because the victims being forgotten and all this, you know, you hear the words like I, I get her daughter. It, it's, it, it is awful. It is really, it is tragic that her daughter had to grow up without her mother, but hearing the words, I lost my mother on that day, the irony of it, it's like, really, those are the words that you pick. You know, imagine if the victims were there in the room. Of course, they would say, you you lost your mother? You lost your mother? But now sometimes the victims don't show up for different reasons. They, uh, pro board, simply can't find them. Um, we have seen hearings we have seen commutation hearings where there are no victims there and it's like, and then, 
you know, six months later after the governor approved it and they have that routine parole hearing, the victims show up and they are enraged and they show up, you know, they fill the Zoom calls. They all have something to say and they're enraged that, and they say that they never got a notification. They never got a letter about the commutation hearing. And we've seen that a bunch of times. Um, so it's always possible that they just weren't notified. I mean, it's hard to understand how there's no victim opposition, right? But there could be other ways that it plays out. It could be that whatever it is she did, they took someone who didn't have any family. That's possible too. Um, but we don't, we don't know. We know nothing about this case. I thought she come came off as very likable though. Like I, um, she, you know, by all accounts to me, I thought, <laughs> I thought that, uh, it was only a good impression. She seems like a warm, sweet person who I would want as a neighbor. Um, but again, that's just, you know, you're not ever supposed to judge a book by its cover, right? But are you supposed to judge someone by their worst moments of their life? Isn't that the million dollar question? But uh, yeah, again, I don't have anything to share. She had one appeal Richard shared where she, where she uh, argued with the courts that she should have had a different way that they're calculating her good time. That's basically what this is. She lost that appeal and had to pay the fees uh, for even filing it, although I don't know. Um, but it's basically how it was calculated. She wanted her good time credits to be calculated on a 35 for 30 basis. Um, her, her argument is based on 2010 amendment of the language. It's not something particularly interesting to me, but I'll include the link there if you want it. Um, but she did know her time. That was interesting. She said to the exact day, and Jim Wise actually, what did, was the Jim Wise said? Do you also know the minutes? That was like one of the few times Jim Wise actually like had a sense of humor. Uh, but it, it has always, it, I, it is something that has intrigued me. Very few inmates say it that way. You know, the years, months, days. We often hear, we hear it sometimes, but often it's it's more of a big block number, you know, 16 years, or sometimes they don't even know. Um, but man, she's uh, she's free. She hasn't. We haven't heard from her. God bless her. Hopefully, she we never hear from her again. And with that, I'll let you go or move to another hearing. I'm not sure how this is going to play out. Okay. Uh, condition number four on January 21st, 2020, you were arrested for committing the offenses of flight from an officer resisting arrest and cruelty to the informant. On April 22nd, 2020, you pled guilty to a misdemeanor charge of false imprisonment and resisting arrest. How do you plead? Uh, on the misdemeanor charges? Yes. Uh, yes, I was informed on the... the how do you plead? Uh, on which one? Uh, how how do you plead to the statement? Okay, uh, let's take let, let's take the misdemeanor charge of false imprisonment. How do you plead? Uh not guilty with a statement, but I pled guilty in court. Uh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So you're pleading not guilty this morning. Yes, sir. How do you plead to Resisting the officer. Uh, in court of law, I pled guilty. Sir. But not guilty. guilty. Okay, so not guilty. Yes, sir. 
Condition number eight. On April 24th, 2020, you were directed to get mental health and substance abuse treatment. However, you failed to do so. How do you plead? Not guilty. With a statement, you said I can make a statement? Or... Yes. Okay. Uh, two days yes, after I was... Sir, I'll ask for your statement after I finish reading the charges. Oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Condition number 10. You are $1,907 in the rears on your supervision fee account. How do you plead? I'm guilty of that. Okay, uh, now, mm -hmm. now, sir. Yes, sir. Let, let's address your not guilty plea with a statement as far as the uh, false imprisonment plea that you made. Uh, the statement on that, uh, a week after I was brought to jail, my parole officer come to me and said, if we get, uh, get the felony charge back to a misdemeanor, that, I, that they would have to, he would release me. I said, yes, sir. So I said, on when I went into court, I was advised by my court appointed attorney and the DA that it would not violate my parole if I pled guilty to the misdemeanor charge. And that's why I pled out to the charge. And let me inform you right now, false imprisonment False imprisonment is a violent offense, and a violent misdemeanor is a revocable offense. Yes, I did not know that. I would have never pled guilty to it. Okay. Now, how do you, you pleaded not guilty to resisting your officer with the statement? What is your statement? Uh, the statement, uh, I was in the field when the officer come to me I, with my hands up. I didn't resist no one. That's my statement. Okay. Condition number condition number eight. You were directed to get mental health and substance abuse treatment and you failed to do so. Uh, yes, sir. I was advised by my parole officer to seek uh, treatment in the facility once COVID dies down and I've got my Medicare and Medicaid back to going and uh Checked into a few places, never had a chance to go because of COVID-19. Okay. And why are you almost three years behind in your supervision? Because I've been locked up all of, nearly all that time. So you've been you've been locked up all the time that you're in the rears of nineteen hundred seven dollars. Yes, sir. I had some, when I first got out November 1st of 17, I had some charges, old charges at Washington I had to go and take care of. And then I was put out here numerous times for substance abuse. Uh, and then uh, uh, two misdemeanor charges. It's, it's, uh, I can't remember all of it, but that's where I've been. And Ed, my parole officer, agreed with that during the preliminary hearing. That's the only reason I haven't had a chance to pay because you know, I draw social security and I'm willing to pay. I want to pay it. I want to do the right thing. Were you drawing Social Security while incarcerated? Yes. And why didn't you pay it? Because uh, I was incarcerated. <laughs> but you still had the money to do it. Well, sir, I, I made commissary and lived here. I couldn't do it while I was locked up. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Wise, do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, in the uh, preliminary hearing uh, the testimony uh, in regards to the police report indicated that when you were booked at the jail, they gave you a drug screen and you were positive for meth. That's uh, that's a negative, no ma'am. Oh, that's not they, true. They did not give me a drug test when I got arrested. No. Oh, okay, okay. That's what the report said, okay. That's all I had, Chairman. Mr. Wise. Mr. Wise, you're muted. Mr. Wise. Also, Paul, there's something I want to go over with you real, real quick. Yes. There's some bill of particulars there that Mr. Rupp said went over with you. Don't you listen to me real, real close. 
you signed the statement saying you would follow these conditions. These conditions while you were out on the street that you would follow these conditions. And rule number four says, <clears throat> this is one of the conditions that you signed. I will not engage in criminal activity, nor will I associate with people who are known to be involved in criminal activity. I avoid bars, casinos, and refrain from illegal use of drugs and alcohol. You sign that to be released. All yeah. right. On 1-21-2020, you were arrested for committing the offense of flight from an officer, resisting an officer, cruelty to the infirm. And on 4-22-2020, they dropped those charges and you pled to a mis- All right. That is, I find you guilty for four. Rule number eight, I will submit my piece of paper to be released on four. I find you guilty on that, on rule eight. And number who's in the Department of Corrections. Supervision fee. Okay. Statement on behalf of his brother. Yes, good morning. Yes, please give us your read that letter. It's, it is a- in fact, he only received $700 of it. Okay, so <laughs> I'm listening but not watching, and I hear the normal Jim Wise cutting in and out, not finishing sentences. That that just seemed normal, really. I, I didn't think anything was up, but then I, after hearing it jump around to different people like the supporters and whatnot, I don't know what happened. I then looked at the screen and realized that it was not only Jim Wise, but there's something wrong with the recording. I don't know... I really don't know how this happened, but I guess these things happen. Thank you. It's all right. For what I've done in my past, I've been addicted to drugs. I have a son that got reunited to me. It's to be free, to get the right medications that I suffer with. United to me. It's to be free, to get the right medications that I suffer with. Uh, most of these things is due to family issues. Uh, and I'm wrong, and I will admit it. And all the guards here at the DC where I've been at have been well respected. I mean, wonderful people. I've met a lot of good people. I'm grateful for my mom, my brother, all my family, and all my brothers around and sisters around the world. You know, and I just wish there was something I could do to erase my past. But I know that can't be done. But I know as as today, with the right help, I know I can succeed. And I know God leading the way. I have no no worries. I'm not a preacher. I just apply some of the things that I learned throughout my stay with the Word of God, applying it to my life, trying to make a better change. I have slipped and fell with drug usage since I've got out. But I never meant to resist or, or, or harm nobody in any kind of way. And I truly apologize from the bottom of my heart for having y'all having to go through this with me today. And I mean that. And I pray if I'm allowed another chance, I will give 120%. And I know if I don't, it's going to be the death of me or the jailhouse. You know, I learned that when I was in treatment before, jails, institutions, and death. And so far, I haven't died a spiritual death. My, my faith has gotten stronger and stronger. But I know if I don't do the works, hey, it's on me. Nobody's fault but my own. And if whatever y'all decide, I, I want to pay my fees. I want to do the right thing. And I, you just don't know how bad I want to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Jessalyn. Thank you. Uh, uh, it was well thought out. I uh, thank you for your final statement. Thank you for listening. Is, is the panel ready to vote? Ready. Mrs. Wise. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jesse Link, I heard this quote this morning. I want to share it with you. Your past is in your head, but your future is in your hand. Your past is in your head but your future is in your hand. I just wanted to put that there. Thank Um, you so much for that. That made perfect sense. 
my uh my I, i'm just uh in, in reviewing the uh, the case material reviewing the allegations and the, the nature of the offense your history i mean your history as a convicted felon there are some some things you, you got to stay between the lines so my vote is that your supervision should be revoked i find you guilty of all the allegations and i would uh make a recommendation that the department of corrections give you a mental health and substance abuse evaluation and, and let something be determined from there you got you got to and get your medications lined out and all of that best wishes to you sir my vote is to revoke today Mr. Wise? At this time, I vote to revoke uh, because of the fail to comply with the conditions set out for probation and parole. Thank you. Mr. Jesse Lake, my determination is that I find you guilty of condition number four. I find you not guilty of condition number eight because of the COVID virus. And I find you guilty of condition number 10. So therefore my vote is to revoke you. It's pleading guilty to a violent misdemeanor, a criminal activity is in violation of your parole contract. You have received three votes to revoke your supervision. Your supervision has been revoked. We have a good day. Thank you. Right, have a good day. This completes our hearing at uh, Franklin Parish Detention Center. Well, sometimes when someone tells you something, you listen. And uh, he said either he's going to be in prison or he's going to pass away. And um, he passed away on 8 31st, 2022, which was almost two years to the date of this hearing. So I guess he was revoked at his time, got out. What's, what's, uh, I guess, tragic, you know, or I, I would say like a reminder um, about seeing, about watching his obituary video is is behind all of these hearings, there is someone who did have a beautiful family, who did have hopes and dreams. And and you look at these pictures and it looks like he had, I mean, not everyone has that, but it looks like he had the whole world is his oyster kind of thing. Looks like he's had a loving family and dreams and goals and loved ones and so often we see people just at the bottom of their bottom of their bottom however it is that they got there I don't know exactly what he did to initially get in. I don't recall if they mentioned it. <clears throat> but I think it's, uh, again, just seeing this is just, for me, it was, you know, I know that I know it, but it's different to see it, right? Thank you, uh, Richard, for for sharing it. And he had a loving family, you know, for someone to go and put together this site for him and put together this whole video. This is a lot of work. I don't know if you've ever done it. I, I've done it a few times. Just making a photo album is hard, but making a video, you go through all the pictures and you go through, I mean, it could take tens of hours to do something like this. But I do agree that they had to revoke him. I mean, you know, that's what you have to do. And it probably was the best thing for him, really. Um, but it is interesting that Miss Wise said 
because we've heard this so many times and it's just it's just a blatant untruth which was i what did she say uh, because he pled to one charge that was a felony and she said oh you can't plead to that it's a felony but it doesn't make a difference what you plead to any involvement in criminal activity will get you revoked and we see so often that people come in with bad advice from attorneys where the attorney says oh just take the misdemeanor charge um but you can't because it's an automatic revocation any involvement in criminal activity is an automatic revocation even if you're not found guilty of it just being involved in it can get you revoked um but man life can come at you real fast it can come at you real fast so with that i'll let